Chapter 3 November 1, 1938, Germany The two Canadians moved as quickly as possible over the cobblestones to a thin dirt path, being sure not to run, not to move so fast that it would draw attention. They needed to appear like workers in a hurry, not like they were fleeing. When they stepped behind a building, Alan said, Who was that? Why are we hiding? Stevenson pressed his face close to the wall. He peered at the street with one eye. His name is Brahms. He's the second in command over all German propaganda. Wow. Alan pressed his palm to his face. What are the odds of that? His mind instinctively started trying to solve the question, shifting from curiosity to surprise and finally fear. His skin turned almost green. They're after us. I mean, after you. That's my guess, Stevenson said. Alan continued as though he was no longer in a conversation, but more like he was writing a paper, even referring to Stevenson in the third person. Statistically speaking, the chances that this is a coincidence are absolutely improbable. Of course, if he was familiar with Stevenson's work, knew the man was in this city studying these people, then the probability shifts from improbable to inevitable. Stevenson nodded slowly. Focus, Alan. The question is not what he is doing here. It's how do we get away. The odds indicate he just wants to talk to you. You're one of the foremost scientists studying propaganda. He uses propaganda extensively. You're no use to him dead. He doesn't. You don't know that, Alan said. Stevenson shifted his body to get a better view of the square. They execute Germans just for listening to foreign broadcasts. What do you think they'll do to us? Foreigners, scientists, specialists in propaganda. Alan's large Adam's apple undulated with stress. I don't have any data on that. Alan, they don't want to talk to us. Stevenson examined the size and angle of the building and tried to determine what would be visible from the main road. He gestured towards a path along the irrigation canal. Let's not find out what they really want. The path eventually intersected with a canal road. They followed it, working their way back towards the barn where they'd hidden their automobile before entering the town. Stevenson didn't want to draw unnecessary attention, so they walked alongside roads toward their goal. As the sun set, Alan slowed his pace. I don't understand the play they're making. They showed up in the middle of town in grand fashion. They wanted us to know they were coming, but why, if not to talk to you? Stevenson nodded. He didn't have an answer to that question yet, but his brain had already started formulating possibilities. Imagine you're them. You want to catch someone, but when you do it, you want to make sure to announce your presence. Why? Alan hung his head for a moment. If I wanted to kidnap someone, I'd sneak into their home at night, quiet, dark, undetected. He ran a hand over his black curls. If I wanted to talk to them, I'd make sure they knew I was visiting, knock on the door, ring the bell. Alan glanced up. It's what logic predicts. Stevenson met Alan's gaze. Try thinking about it as a risk analysis. What's the safest possibility? Brahms wanted it known he was in the small town. Why? Stevenson considered three possibilities. First, Brahms's presence could be an attempt to scare Stevenson off. If that were so, they could roll into town with a big show and a few minutes later return to Berlin. Second, this was a trap. They didn't want to bother hunting their target. They could drive Stevenson to a place of their choosing. Finally, there was Alan's idea that the Germans simply wanted to talk. Brahms had never seemed like a Nazi hardliner. It was possible Brahms was a scientist first and a fascist second. Alan, Stevenson called to his assistant. What do you think? It's easier to know where we are going than hunt us where we run. Alan smiled as though his maxim clarified his meaning. They know we are foreigners, so they must assume we flew in through Berlin. That means they will assume our car is on one of the northern roads. Which it is, Stevenson said. What's the math say? Alan nodded. 
Based on the number of men they had, they could cover all the roads headed towards Berlin. If they are smart, they would have roadblocks there. We should go south. If they had more men than we counted, they might have blocked all the roads, and we should avoid them. So how do we get back to Berlin? Alan shrugged. Math doesn't answer that question. It's a creative problem. Stevenson smiled. Well, I guess we will creatively walk south through the farmland. As the sun sank behind the horizon, the chill air turned bitter cold. Moisture from their breath crystallized in the air before vanishing into the night. Stevenson pulled the map from his pocket and pointed out two cities. These are the closest, but they are disproportionately loyal to the party. If the Nazis are looking for us, they will have spies and volunteers there. We'll have to skip them. Alan stopped in the middle of a cornfield. The ears had all been stripped in the October harvest, but the dead stalks still stood. I'm starving. Do you think we can eat these? He touched a dead leaf and crunched it in his fingers, and the frost coating drifted to the ground. Stevenson could feel his own hunger stirring. They'd been walking for hours. He was exhausted, thirsty, and hungry. He glanced out at the road. They had stayed off it, but followed alongside so they wouldn't get lost. Don't know. I don't think it will hurt you, but you might not be able to digest it either. I've never heard of people eating corn stalks. The roar of an engine dampened their conversation. They froze as a car swerved down the road. It stopped suddenly. The door opened and loud laughter exploded over the quiet fields. A man stumbled out, shouting back at his friends. His words slurred as though he was drunk. He weaved his way in front of the headlights. On his arm was the bright red band of the Nazi party. He moved out of the light and dropped to one knee at the side of the road. Stevenson was sure he heard the man's vomit splashing against some rocks. The scientist held his breath and listened for Alan's, but there was only silence. More doors on the car opened, and voices shouted from inside. A stray bottle was thrown out. Stevenson drew in a sharp breath, hoping the bottle wouldn't break, that it would be abandoned and not empty. It would give them something, a few drops of liquid, a few calories. A moment later, the glass shattered. Should we hide? Alan whispered. The Germans continued to talk loudly. No, we shouldn't move, Stevenson replied. In the moonlight, they would be shadows in the corn, nothing more. But if they started to move, they could draw attention. He shifted his gaze to his assistant. Moonlight caught Alan's face. It was possible hiding was the better option. Never mind. Lower yourself slowly. So slow that it seems like you'll never get into a crouch. What are the odds these Nazis are looking for us? This road, this night, my guess, Stevenson whispered. One hundred percent. That's when the flashlights turned on. At least four men now stood on the road sweeping the field with lights. One of them called out. Where the hell did he go? He was right here. Stevenson's skin prickled. Alan's eyes widened as he continued his slow downward movement. The soldiers continued their complaints. What an ass, we should just leave him, another answered. He's Brahm's nephew, we can't. Besides, he might freeze to death, how would we explain that? Stevenson's eyes darted to his assistant again. Alan showed no sign of understanding. The concern about dying in the cold had crossed his mind earlier. He knew they couldn't sleep tonight. They would have to keep moving. Only the heat from physical action would be enough to keep them alive. The frozen weeds and corn crunched under the soldiers' boots as they marched into the fields. They flicked their lights over the stalks. If we find that idiot passed out in his vomit again, I'm not carrying him. A single flashlight flicked to the ground and began sweeping back and forth. Sweat rolled down Stevenson's sides. If the men found them hiding, they would undoubtedly think they were concealing something. Jewish heritage or espionage foreigners. 
No conclusion the Nazis reached would be good. The footsteps drew closer. It would be better to turn themselves in than be caught hiding. Stevenson debated his options. He could stand now and pretend to be grateful the soldiers came along, tell them he was visiting the country and got lost. Perhaps, in their drunken state, the Nazis wouldn't recognize them. He needed to make a decision soon. If he waited too long, that would also be suspicious. Alan swallowed, and the sound caught his teacher's attention. There was another option. Alan could turn himself in while Stevenson remained hidden. They weren't looking for Alan, and it would lead them away. It also meant he wouldn't have to worry about the man dehydrating, freezing, or starving. But it created a new set of problems. Alan was fluent in German, but he hadn't learned to pick up a specific accent yet. Talking to an ordinary person, they might wonder where he was from. However, if he talked to the stormtroopers, it would make them suspicious. He wanted to talk the problem over with his assistant, but the Nazis were too close. A light waved over the Canadians' heads. If they hadn't started their slow descent, it would have hit them straight in the face. But all it illuminated were empty corn stalks. It stopped. Its yellow beam focused on the stalk Alan had plucked earlier. The light tracked back through the rows of corn. A voice spoke quietly, as though trying not to be heard. The frost is missing. Stevenson glanced up at the lighted plants. Where he and Alan had walked, they had stripped the frost from the stalks with their coats. He knew the best possible outcome would be for Alan to stand and go with them. But he also saw the terror in his assistant's face. Alan had said the statistical probability was that Brahms wanted to talk to him, nothing else. Stevenson hoped the math was right. He gestured for Alan to stay down and slowly rose until the flashlight illuminated his face. Stevenson raised his hands above his head. I believe you're looking for me, he said in German. He advanced toward the soldiers, explaining how he came to be in the cornfield in the middle of the night.